Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Deputy Chief Justice. How are you? I'm fine. How are you, Chief Justice? I'm fine, thanks. Uh, let's get to it. You have many university degrees, Judge Bali. Yes. Mm, not just in, in law, but uh, in commerce and uh, science as well. In commerce and in sociology, yes. Sociology, oh yeah. Yes. Hmm. Your career, I'm just trying to trace where you started. Uh, oh, well. You, you have a long experience in the labor law sphere. You worked both as a mediator and arbitrator under IMSA? Yes. For a total of eight years? Yes. I was also on the IMSA board of trustees at the time. Mm -hmm. But I think it needs to go a little bit back. I was involved in the union movement, so it was a natural progression to go into yes. to IMSA and to do that because I'd already been active in the labor movement. So. And I, 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 I find it a, a bit odd that you did not end up in the labor courts. Were you not interested to follow that progression? I, I, my practice, I did a lot of labor law work because it automatic, it came very naturally to me. I appeared a lot in the labor court, in the labor appeal court. Mm -hmm. um, but I also did other work as well. Uh, as you will see, uh, I mean, much of it you can't see here, but they would have gone in my application for senior counsel status. Mm -hmm. And so I did a lot of constitutional, administrative, and some commercial work at the time. So I thought high court would have been more appropriate for me. Uh, yep. And that's how I ended up in the high court. Yes. And you were appointed in 20. 2010. 2010, I acted. 2012, I think I was appointed. Or oh, you were only acting um, in 2010. In 2010, for a stint, just a short stint. Hmm. Oh, I see. And you have been involved uh, with the competition appeal court since 2016. Since 2016, that's correct. Mm. So you are no stranger in the appellate court. No, I'm no stranger in that. And I've yes. sat in a number of three branch appeals in the High Court as well. Mm. So yes, no, I'm no, no stranger to appeals. Yes. You have produced an impressive body of reported judgments since your appointment as a judge in 2012. How many are they? Just an estimate would, 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 would do, the, but it's the, a lot. The number of judgments in journals, like essay law reports, also in criminal law reports, would come out to about 30. The judgments, including SAFLI and uh, JDRs, competition law reports, what I didn't put in here because I couldn't find them, was tax law reports. There are quite a few in tax law reports, but I didn't put them in. So in total, if you added all of them, they're 57, but 30 of them are in essay law reports, all South African law reports, essay criminal law reports added together. I do give the citations of each of the judgments that I've identified as reported and where they've reported as an annex in my, yeah. to, to my application. And you've published a few articles as well. Yes, particularly when I was in, in, the, in, in the labor law field, and I did publish in sociology as well. Mm. Right. You have not acted at the SCA. That is correct. Should that disadvantage you in any way? I would think not, and I would like to say why I think not. Yes, please. In my view, uh, Deputy Chief Justice, is that, yes, 
it would have been a, 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 a an, an opportunity, it would have been good to act in there, um, it would have been a privilege to act in there, but unfortunately for me, it just didn't work out. I wasn't lucky enough. But I believe that the quality of my judgments, I believe my work ethic, I believe my, all of which are, are demonstrated in the application, uh, Deputy Chief Justice, uh, make me a suitable candidate to be in that court. So, yes, I do accept that acting there would have, would, have been very, would have been advantageous, but I don't believe that it, it, it's, it's in any way a handicap that should prevent me from sitting. I believe that I'm actually a suitable candidate to sit in that court. And I think many of the people who commented on my application have said, said so as well, you know. But it's unfortunate. I was just not lucky. Sometimes luck doesn't come for, with you, you know. Yeah. It's one of those things. Uh, right. you, you would be aware that uh, a huge bulk of the work that we do, that is done at the SCA, uh, comprises um, applications for leave to appeal, well mm -hmm. over a thousand per, per year. Over a thousand years. It's, it's quite a lot. Um, do you know the difference between leave to appeal and special leave to appeal? Yes, leave to appeal. The, the, I, I said, as a court of first instance, I deal with leave to appeal. Yes. I've explained a number of judgments what the test is available in there. In fact, one of them I've written a lengthy judgment on that. That was the one in which I applied Rule 53 to a, an, a, 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 an executive decision, and then there was an application for leave to appeal in which I wrote quite a, a much longer judgment than, you generally, than what one generally writes for an application for leave to appeal. I know that. Special leave and then also exception petitions, if, if, if that's what, uh, Referring to Chief Justice, uh, Deputy Chief yes, Justice, is. yes, I'm aware of that. I look at some of those, uh, and I want to see whether there's anything special that calls for it. And I'm also aware that there must be some sort of public interest over and above the test of whether another court would come to a different conclusion, having been invested with the same facts. I'm aware of those differences, and I'm aware of the differences, and then the need for exceptional yes. circumstances. Uh, the, I, I know you, 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 you work in a very, well, probably the busiest division in, 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 the, in the country. Uh, quite a busy division, yes. And you straddle two courts in, in addition yes. to, to, to all of that. So you are used to hard work. But uh, the work pace at, at, the, at the SCA is quite frenetic. Yes. Uh, it's, it's, it's extremely d demanding. And uh, what makes, what adds to the pressure is the convention there to produce judgments in the same term that the appeal would have been had. So that, that, that that's, uh, it, 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 just, it just piles on yes. the, the, the tremendous pressure that, that, that there is already. Uh, I just want to know well, your, your, your CV shows uh, a, a, a person of, of good, strong work ethic. Hmm. But I just want to hear from you if you think you'd be able to keep up with the pace there. Undoubtedly so, hmm. uh, Deputy Chief Justice. These are some of the things I must be honest, I find difficult to speak about because one is really trying to, to, to sell your, your candidacy and say, no, you know, it's sometimes like kind of self-praise, you know. But I can say without fear of contradiction that I've produced a lot of judgments in very short time mm. involving voluminous papers. What I did learn from them is sometimes you need to, to just step back because you, so en you get so engrossed in it and you work till late hours in the evening because you've got other work to do in other times uh, during the day and that it can be difficult. 
I accept that, but I've found a way of, of, of meeting those challenge, challenges, and fortunately I've been able to perform at, at the pace required in my courts. I mean, in my courts, as you say, Deputy Chief Justice, are not light courts in terms of workload. The workloads are very heavy. Yeah. Um, you know, there's something, Deputy Chief Justice, that I think I didn't just say it so that the public out there also gets to know. Because they tend to think that we sit on judgments, etc. There's a lot of extra, I don't even call it judicial work, but extra work from a court. I do case managements and I do quite a lot of them. And nowadays because of the digital system, uh, uh, the benefits of a digital system, of a virtual system, I do all, a lot of that between seven and nine at night. So a lot of my case managements are done in that time. There's a lot of other things I deal with. I have dealt with some petitions that come when there's no leave to appeals in, given in, um, I can't remember when, but they did do those. So yes, there is a lot of extra work, the reviews, um, surrogacy uh, uh, agreements, uh, and I've done quite a lot of those as well. Um, and that takes quite a lot of one's time, and it's not exactly shown in what the public and what others see about the amount of work one puts in, in this profession, in this vocation. There's a lot of work, and, and I've learned to accept, or I have accepted for a while to go, that there's no escaping doing the hard work yourself, and that there's no escaping reading the documents yourself. Uh, so, and going through everything yourself. Uh, on to a thorny issue. And I'm reminded, uh, I was reminded of this uh, when I went through the comments from the professional bodies, especially that of the GCP. The, your interview in April 2018 I had recently become a member of the JSC then, and I vividly remember uh, those interviews. And I remember being left with a very unsettling feeling after your interview, when you were questioned by the then JP, uh, Judge Dennis Davis. Uh, that was quite an unpleasant exchange, to put it mildly. And uh, that just made me wonder about your temperament. As mm. I experienced it, you, you, you lost your temper. And uh, it just unsettled me that a, judicial, a candidate for a judicial position would actually allow themselves to lose their temper in front of the JSC. Oh, do you want to comment on, 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 yes, on yes. this? observations of mine. Yes, look, I'm sorry. I'm, it's clear to me anxiety got the better of me on that day. I'm sorry about that. It has never been a problem between me and Judge Davis. I mean, we've worked together very well. But on that particular day, I, I did get um, riled, and I, and I think I, I regret it. I mean, I did say to him that you are, um, your, your eye contact with me is beginning to disrupt my tend of thought. And, and uh, yes, I didn't intend to insult or hurt him, and he never saw it as that. And as I understand it, the JSC never thought that it was something that, uh, that I acted out of order. But if I did, I do apologize for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I certainly regret that. But it's certainly not an indication of uh, me losing temper all the time. I mean, that's just, I would be, that would be an inappropriate conclusion. Um. But then there are the comments made by the JSC. I'm just going to, to confine myself to those relating to your temperament. And they report on what count, they say council has, uh, has told them, that you have been described as abrupt and discourteous at times with counsel that that is. That to me tends to show a, a pattern, a, 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 a quality that, uh, a quality. 
that you, you, you have? I don't think that's correct, uh, Deputy Chief Justice, and I'd have to say why. Firstly, I, I know some people dissociate themselves because the way that that comment is written, it says there thereafter that other senior counsel do not agree with it and dissociate themselves from that comment. But that's not what I would rely upon. I do accept that um, I can sometimes be firm with people and I have said this before in front of the, to this body, that I have sometimes been forced to be firm in court in order to make sure that there's order in my court, in order to ensure that there's decorum in my court. And if you don't do some of those things, then you can lose control of the process. So I have sometimes been that. And yes, I'm, I have a human, I'm a human being with some flaws. I can't, I'm not going to sit here and say I'm, ex, I'm a perfect human being. That would be, that would well, be full none of us are perfect, uh, <laughs> Judge Bailey. Sorry, Madam. No, no, I was just saying none of us are perfect. Thank you, thank you, Chief Justice, yes. So I don't think that that's entirely correct. I mean, I have never received specific uh, complaints from any one of them. And sometimes people don't like the decisions you take it, and you have to tell them about it. And they sometimes see it as being harsh and discourteous. I don't know, I can't speak for them, but I'm just speaking generally. So no, I, I don't think that's a fair comment of my general approach in my court. Um, I really don't think so. In fact, the contrary. Well, sorry, have you finished? Yes, I am finished. All right. Um, I raise these difficult questions and I'm sure you can tell that I'm, I'm quite uncomfortable putting them. I yeah. raise them because the the, the, the Supreme Court of Appeal being an appellate court requires a team player. Yes. You would not be sitting alone there while you, you, you are in the appeal court as it is now, so you know what I'm talking about. Yes. You, most of the time you work with four other people. Yes. Who, and it's, you know, wh 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 wherever you get more than one person, that personality, they're going to be personality clashes and, and all of that. So it is important that the SCA coming with its history, coming from where it has been, uh, collegiality matters quite a lot there, and it's a delicate, it's a delicate uh, ex exercise. So, um, and I mean, quite apart from that, as you, you mentioned uh, the decorum of the court, so judges need to behave in a specific way. There's the judicial code of conduct that requires us to, to be a certain way, especially towards uh, the, 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 the council, the, the, the people mm -hmm. who ply their, their, their trade in, in our courts, the litigants. So we, a judge cannot be rude, a judge cannot be impatient, yes. a judge, you, 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 you understand what I'm, yes. I'm, I'm trying to say to you. So it is, an issue of temperament is, is quite critical. And uh, that's why I need an assurance from you that uh, I can, I can, you can be a nice person, yeah. if I can put it simply. No, I, will, I can give you that assurance, <laughs> you know, unqualifiedly. I've sat in a number of three bench judgments. I've sat in the competition appeal court, quite a, quite a lot, in fact, in the competition appeal court. So, yes, I've been sitting in, 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 with, with, with uh, other judges I've accepted the lead of other judges when they, they're leading it. I've led benches, I've led the three benches. I now lead almost all the, in every competition appeal matter that I sit, I'm the lead judge now, because I'm the most senior judge in that court. Um, so yeah, I've done that, I've had the control process, and in none of them have it, can it ever be said that I've not acted collegially. What can be said is I have dissented in my judgments. But that's not uncollegial. Mm. I have issued uh, 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 dissenting judgments. Uh, in fact, they're on record there. But it's never been uncollegial at all. I mean, it has been very polite, and this is uh, our differences of view. We sometimes have a discussion that can be quite, uh, you know, that has been robust, but it has never been rude. It is never, nobody's ever told me well, I have told anybody that I think their views are silly or stupid or whatever, or I got no respect for them, and that, 
and nobody treated me with disrespect. That has happened. So yeah, I can't remember. Maybe, the, but there has been. I mean, no, it's it's not an easy process. I'll accept that. I'll accept personalities can clash, but I'm careful to recognize that there are clear boundaries. Mm. So, unless Deputy Chief Justice, I mean, whether I've trespassed on any of that, I can't tell off uh, off the hand now. And I've obviously haven't got any complaints, and I've acted in so many. I mean, I've participated in so many, three in so many appeal processes, so many, and I've led in so many of them. All right. No, thank you, Judge Valley. I'm going to hand over to my colleagues to put questions to you if there's any. Thank you, Deputy Chief Justice. Okay. Look at you, Minister. Uh, thank you, um, TCJ, and uh, good afternoon, Judge Valley. Good afternoon. Uh, yes, my, my question is in relation to the matter that you handled of the Democratic Alliance versus the Minister of International Relations. Yes. What is your view to the fact that the diplomatic and the international relations matters should be left to, to the executive because of the nature of the polycentric leaden type of matters that often arise. Minister, I'm very, more than other people, I think, more than some of my colleagues, I'm sensitive to separation of powers. I really am sensitive to it. And if one of, it might come up in one of the cases that I'll have dealt with, and I'll explain why view on separation of powers. The judgment is quite careful not to trespass on the areas that fall within the jurisdiction of the executive. However, I had to apply what I believe was a fair application of our law. And our law is slightly different than the US law on this question. In the US, there's much more deference towards an executive decision conferring diplomatic immunity. In our law, it's not. It has to comply with certain requirements, and I deal with that. I think it's something to do with the usus and an opinio juris, and, and I go in thorough detail with that in my, in, in, in my judgment. Um, so I don't believe that I trespass the role of taking over uh, or trespass the role of, of a judge uh, uh, or enter the terrain of an executive decision making power. As far as polycentric nature of it, I respect that, I accept that there is polycentric nature of executive decision, and that's the main reason why we should stay clear of it. But the executive has to comply with the Constitution and the law. Judges have to comply with, this, uh, uh, with the Constitution and the law. And in that case, I found that that, 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 that that did not occur. And I gave my reasons. And they quite, I mean, they were very carefully expressed and, and, and sensitively taken, uh, uh, sensitively articulated. I, sh I should hope so. I never got uh, an application for leave to appeal. Um, if I did, I probably would have granted them because it was a matter that does give one anxiety because this is a matter that involves government policy and that has implications for, for government actions. I'm aware of that. In fact, it's clear in most of the cases I read for that judgment, and I refer to them in that judgment. Yeah, my last one relates to the one on uh, Transnet and uh, IJS uh, Consulting, uh, where you are dealing with a contract um, uh, uh, which you believed was loaded in corruption, and uh, you went beyond the <clears throat> just declaring the contract invalid. Do you think, with the prevalence of uh, corruption in our country, we have reached the stage where there should be more judgments like this, where you don't only declare it to be illegal, but you should ensure that 
those that participated, if you believe there was some kind of corrupt activity, should not benefit or be enriched through such contracts? Absolutely. But, it, and, and, and I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's a going to be a difficult issue because sometimes you can't just apply, so supply uh, public law uh, 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 principles to it. Sometimes you can, I don't know. But yes, if a contract has been marred by irregularity, and I've said this in a number of my judgments, then I believe that contract should be set aside. And I believe that whoever benefits therefrom should, should be deprived of those benefits. I must say this, Minister, you find some of that in the competition matters as well, collusive practices, etc. And I've not taken uh, a lenient approach to all of them. If you look at my judgments, you see that I take quite a hard line where I see illegal and irregular practices coming out. Um, Thank you, uh, DCJ. Thank you, uh, Minister. Thank you, Deputy Chief Justice. Good afternoon, uh, Judge Van. Thank you, Acting President Petsy. Good afternoon. During your previous interview for a position in the Constitutional Court, I raised with you uh, the number of your judgments that were overturned by the Supreme Court of Appeal when I put to you that according to the report by the GCB, close on to 50% of your judgments that went on appeal to the SEA were overturned. Do you wish to respond to that? I, I said then at the time, and I still hold on to that, I believe that it's not a fair reflection or correct reflection or accurate reflection of the number of judgments that went to the Supreme Court of Appeal that were, uh, and that were overturned. Because there was many we don't know of where there was applications for leave to appeal. We never have that. Those that we do know, there were some that have been overturned. In fact, in my application where I'm asked to indicate how many of my judgments were overturned, I said there were six that I could find and three that were upheld. I've subsequently found that there were even more upheld, you know, that I haven't put in there. So it's very difficult to say how many were overturned. Um, but that I have been overturned, I accept. I've been overturned a number of times. Uh, if it was six that I could find, then there were six judgments that were clearly uh, found to be wanting by the SCA. By the SCA. But I don't believe it's fair to say 50% of my judgments before the SCA were overturned. I think it's, it's, it's less than that. Okay. And... <laughs> During your interview, I think last October, you were asked by the chair of the commission to share with us the number of reported judgments that you had written. And your response to the Chief Justice and to Commissioner Malema on that aspect left me none the wiser. 
you were not able to tell the commission how many of your judgments were reported or found their way into the law reports. The closest you came was that you had marked your judgments reportable. And the sense I got was that you regarded those judgments as having been reported because you had marked them reportable. Would you like to respond to that? Acting, Acting President Petsen, thanks for that question. I accept that at the time I could not tell how many were reported and, how, and where, they, uh, but I could tell the, the list indicated which particular ones were reported or uh, where they were reported. Yes, it said reportable and it didn't say reported. Yes, I said that I didn't compile that myself. Uh, Commissioner Malema uh, <coughs> chastised me for it. I correctly believe you, I believe he was correct to do so. I accepted it at the time. And I believe that since then I've now cleared that up. I've done this myself. You have a list before you as an annexure that tells you all the reported judgments. <coughs> the Deputy Chief Justice has just asked me that question earlier. And I've tell you where they are reported, which ones are reported, and I've given you a full list. I must say, that it's not even a complete list, but that's to my detriment because it doesn't cover what's in the tax courts and what's in the competition appeal courts. And that's because it's just been very difficult for me with the limited resources available to actually find out where and what is going on. But I tried to do this myself. So yes, at that interview, I was not able to inform you what they were but I certainly am able to do so now, and I've given you the full list. And it has been out there for anybody who wants to comment on my application to check it out. Thank you. Earlier on, uh, you told the commission that one of your greatest attributes is work ethic. Yes. I don't know whether you would still recall this matter of Kadak Pension Fund and others versus the executive officer of the Financial Services Board it's a matter which had served before the SCA on the 17th of November 2017, was remitted to the High Court for further evidence and determination of certain issues set out in the order. The matter served before you, pursuant to that order, on 11 October 2021, council ready to run a hearing and you sent them away and said that that order was ambiguous and they must seek clarity from the SCA. I don't have a full recollection of the matter. I've got a vague recollection of it. If there's an allegation that it was sent away because I was running away from work, that's not correct. If there's a judgment call that I made that may be wrong about what the order meant, that's a different issue. On the issue of it being, on, on it being clarity being sought, there was a debate and a dispute between the parties as to what the order meant. Neither of them could agree on that. There were certain things that were said to me about what happened. If I recall, yes, if I recall, what had happened is the parties had written the order. It was an agreement, if I recall correctly, an agreement between the parties as to what the order should be. And the one party said that they were the parties that drafted the agreement and not the other party, and the other party said we did not agree to that. The court had just endorsed it. 
And so it caused a problem, and I wasn't willing to make a decision that impugns the court or that makes a decision against what that court says. I said, that court is more than capable of saying what had happened in its situation. I think that particular matter, if I rem yes, that matter is still before me on the case management. They were not ready. They were, they were the ones who brought this to me, saying they're debating and they can't agree on it. They went back, they still came back to me, and I've had to force them to try and get the hearing held. One of them, or some of them, gave me the impression they're not wanting to go ahead, and they wanted to go and seek these issues, and they gave them that opportunity. In fact, I may have set the matter down recently again without and asked for papers to be brought in quickly. There was an intervention application I dealt with at seven o'clock at night. So there's a lot more going on in that particular case. That case, yes, now it's coming back. That case has its origins in 2010 or something, or 2012. It's gone very far back, if I remember. It's the issue about a pension fund so an administrator having a, fi a, a dispute with, with the ex trustees, etc. There's quite a lot involved in it. And of course, I don't remember all of it because I'll have to read it and I will read it before I meet them again. And of course, the less I say about it, the better because the matter is still before me. Um, yeah. I think we can leave it at that, uh, Judge Bell. Thank you, uh, Acting. Uh, President uh, you, you would have been provided with a copy of the comments by the GCB. And yes, I have. And the aspect that I wish to take up with you appears in paragraph 11.1.3. Yes, uh, I President. Mm. Are, are you there? Mm. Yes, I am. There's a reference to a matter that served before you in October 2018, which was an, which was opposed. Council for the applicants presented argument, and Council for the respondent did likewise in answer, and sought to rely on a case not referred to in his heads of argument and handed up a copy from the bar to you. And you took an adjournment to quickly go through the case. And when you came back, you didn't continue with the hearing. You, in fact, adjourned the matter sine die. And it had to be re-argued before another judge. Again, costs wasted. And council believed that you left them in the last year. You had no reason after you had had argument and council for the respondent had argued, handed up a judgment that he wanted you to have a look at. You accepted the judgment, adjourned in order to consider it, and when you came back, you adjourned the matter, effectively leaving the parties in the lurch. That is not correct, just the acting President Petzer. And really, honestly, it is not correct. For, for anyone to accept that this is absolute truth would be, 
what would require them to actually be satisfied that all the, all the facts are contained here. And they're not. I don't run away from writing judgments. On the contrary, I write judgments quickly. I write judgments well. And I write considered judgments. And I write scholarly judgments. That's a fact, acting justice president, acting president. I would never have done this. What happened, to the best of my recollection, is the other party fell ambushed. And I thought that was not in the interest of justice for one party to be ambushed. I don't know the full details, but I also take a firm hand when someone tries to ambush somebody else. It happens all the time in our courts. So I don't believe it's fair to say that I, I ran away or I run away from matters. The opposite is the truth, and my record speaks for it. You have a list of judgments here that have given you absolute full details of all the cases. If anything, parties feel unhappy that I do not wish to give up the matter, that I say, let's finish the matter here and now, or as soon as we can, or can you file on a certain date, we'll then come back and hear on that. But there's no allegation, there can be no allegation that I run away from it or that I don't have a good work ethic. My work ethic is demonstrated by the, quality, by the amount of judgments I've written, the quality of those judgments. Judge so pres uh, uh, Acting President Petzer. And that's what one should focus upon. They're there in front of everybody to see. Well, the judge's work, work ethic is equally important because it serves no purpose to be allocated what to do and you don't do the work. Well, absolutely. But because the comment here goes further and say that the matter had to be uh, taken to another judge who had the parties and dispose of the matter Justice Petzi, by granting the application. So, Justice Petzi, let's read that carefully. If it was postponed sin ADA, it can't just go to another judge. No other judge will just pick it up and take it. It will have to be put back on the roll, and they would have had to do and correct what was, was an, an address to any issues or problems they had before that. And that's what would have happened. So when it came before Justice Tsoka, it wasn't as if it came the same day. If that's the impression you're getting, it's not a correct impression, Acting President Petsy. It's a matter that was postponed sine die. Once yes, it's postponed sine die, it means it goes back in the role. It goes back and they will address whatever issues they have and any concerns they have. And if other and remember there are two parties here. There are always two parties. And one party felt that you are now you're not taking me off guard, you're ambushing me. And you shouldn't be allowed to do that. And I haven't had the opportunity, and you can't, and this happens quite often, you can't just stand up and say, after it's, it's your turn to argue, I've got such and such a judgment, and you could read this judgment, and not even provide it to the other party beforehand, and then hand it on the side. This happens all the time, and say, here's a copy for my learned friend. That's not how justice should work, uh, acting President Petzer. And I think a view on it, I try and make sure both parties have a fair opportunity to go through all the cases that each other wish to raise, and that they have a fair opportunity to present their own submissions with regard to that. So, and this no, is I no accept, reflection, that, no judge, reflection judge, on my work ethic, acting president. If you want to really look at my work ethic objectively and fairly, look at the judgments that are written, look at the amount of pages those judgments, look at the number of cases that are referred to in those judgments. Look at the amount of self-research I've done in those judgments. There is no doubt that there's a there's substantial wealth of information to show that the work ethic is very high. Thank you, Judge uh, Thank Bali. You, we'll we'll leave it at that. I'm going to interpose and put you something I should have uh, 
addressed with you at the outset. I, I do apologize. Uh, there, there is a pending complaint against oh, yes. you with the JCC. Yes. It, uh, lodged by Econ Oil, the respondent. Yes. In a review application you had uh, brought by ESCOM. And the complaint is that you relied on a non existent affidavit in, in making your finding. And the complaint just focuses on your erroneous reliance on non existent evidence. Uh, it's a matter that arose, I believe, uh, according to the record, when you interviewed for the Constitutional Court. They can see earlier on this year. Yes. You are aware of that complaint? I've responded to it. Or you have? No, it's all done. The complaint was lodged nine months ago. It was brought to my attention about a month ago, or two months no, no, ago. The one I'm talking about was lodged on the 28th of August, just last um, a few weeks ago. I thought it was 28 August 2021. I'm Sorry? not sure. But it was lodged because it refers to my candidature as a constitu in the Constitutional Court. But let's, I mean, I don't want to skirt the issue. I think I want to address the issue. I think one person sitting here was probably counsel in that matter. Um, you know, but yes, I did. And it was pointed out to me that I referred to an affidavit. I said that there was a confirmatory affidavit when in fact there was not. And now I've looked into the situation. I've come to the conclusion, yes, there was no confirmatory affidavit. But I must say this, and I said this then, that it, if there was an error, it is thrown out of proportion. It is not a significant error. It did not affect the outcome of the, of the judgment. It would not. And I can refer to it now. In fact, if people want to go and look at the judgments, they are before this. I have submitted that judgment as one of the judgments for people to consider. And I think, I don't know where it is in this document, DCG. What are you looking for? The DCG. actual Let me see reference. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. Just carry on. Did you find what you were looking for? It's on Our page. It's on page three one one, Judge Valley. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Three one one. And while you are looking for page 311, I mean, just mention that the, the, the concern actually is that you would dis just cursorily dismiss that kind of error as a minor issue. It's just your approach to your committing an error of that nature. Do you know, let me start by saying a few points. First point. This was a matter involving this was a special motion, and the papers before me were over 4,000 pages. This is one matter that taught me, be careful of working till late at night all alone with all these papers. But let's look at the error, and let's look at this point you raise, uh, <coughs> Deputy Chief Justice. The error is to be found on page Five, five D or five E, paragraph five D. Let's notice. Right, right on five D, in that page three one five, I record that the very person had issued or had made a report. I put down what he what his memorandum states, and he says what happened in with regard to this issue. Then I say in 5E, and this is where the error lies. It says, Mr. Shitangano and Mr. Hevu have both provided sworn testimony in the form of confirmatory affidavits. That's the only error they've identified. It should have had only Mr. Shitangano has provided sworn testimony. Mr. Hevu did not. That's what they're saying is the error. 
Looking at the judgment as a whole, it's an insignificant error insofar as the outcome is concerned. That's been confirmed by the Supreme Court of Appeal. It has been refused leave to appeal. They've then petitioned that to yourself, Deputy Chief Justice, You've, and they've brought that to your attention. You have refused them the petition. So Deputy Chief Justice, that error had no impact on the outcome. There is a lot of other testimony that goes on. Mr. Khalib Kassim gave an air, a supporting affidavit. I simply mistook the view that Mr. Hewu had provided a confirmatory. In the amount of paper on me, I thought I saw it. When I wrote this particular paragraph with this said so, I thought I had done it. It was wrong. I admitted it's wrong. It's a regrettable error but it has not affected the outcome of the judgment, and the judgment has been upheld. Uh, it has been upheld by the Supreme Court of Appeals. Yes, indeed. What, what you me. said in, in the latter part of your statement is actually what I think uh, these parties themselves, including me, were looking for, that expression of, of regret for committing the error. Because no, it was a regretful error, and uh, I really regret it. I mean, I'm, I've made many errors of fact in many judgments I've written, I wouldn't, I mean, that's why you get overturned. And this is one of those, but, unfor but fortunately, or unfortunately, it did not affect the outcome of the judgment. In fact, the judgment, as I say, is quite lengthy. It goes on, right up to page 350. Well, Dismiss the, the, the application for leave to appeal, and that, that was the end of it. Yes, it was. It, it well, they petitioned. Your, yeah. What, what I must say, in fairness to the person who brought the complaint, in fairness to that person, is this the person felt that when I said to this body that this issue is being blown out of proportion, now remember, this thing was a newspaper article that supposedly came a few days before my interview, and so it was just brought to my attention at the interview, and some members of the commission complained that I was being ambushed, and they tried to cut it short, and they said it's not fair upon me. And I said, that error was never pointed out to me. It was never pointed out to me at the application for leave to appeal. So what I said is, had it been brought before me at the application for leave to appeal, perhaps I should have. And perhaps, and now that they've petitioned, perhaps the SCA will take a different view because it's been brought to their attention that there is an error in this judgment, which error is simply that did Mr. Hewu confirm. Mr. Shitangano does it, Mr. Kalib Kesem does it, but did Mr. Hewu also do it? It's just the third confirmatory affidavit. And I said he did, and that was wrong, and it's regrettable. And they said, well, if I said that, then why did I not grant leave to appeal? But it wasn't brought to me when I wrote the application for leave to appeal. It was not brought to my attention at that point. And I did with this judgment till late hours in the evening. Council is sitting here. I, they tried every, uh, there was all attempts to try and get this matter moved on. First attempt was to say, let's call three bench or something. There were some other attempts afterwards. And I said, no, you file your heads, leave, leave them limited time. And I went through and I gave the judgment. I think I finished it in two weeks' time or weeks and a half's time. 9 June, 29 June. It took me about 20 days. And it was very, very, very large matter, voluminous matter. But I regret the error. I honestly say to you, I sit here remorseful about that error. Small as it may be, it is an error. Thank you, um, Thank Judge you, Justice. Thank you, uh, Deputy Chief Justice. I'm sure you would want, I want us to correct this for the record. When Judge Valley was responding to what the uh, acting president was saying, he said, don't bombard me with something that was never brought to my attention. But according to the records in front of us, it is, it is in something that was raised by the GCB, and all the candidates received the objections that had come to them. So this thing of synergy... I'm confused. This thing of synergy, it's here in the, in the objections coming from GCB. Yes. 
and that was what was raised by acting president Pitsi. I just want to put it correct for the record because he said we are bombarding him and the JSC have got this negative name outside of bombarding people. So I'm putting it for the record that that is not something that is coming out of the blue. It is part of the records that was there and that is what I want to correct, right. please. Thank, thank you for bringing that to our attention, Commissioner. It's, it's, it's noted. Uh, do you want to say something, uh, Judge? I, I'm actually, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure I understand what's going on. I'm, DCJ, I have to perhaps, ask. If I may just come in uh, before before the candidate does. I think, with respect, to what Judge that uh, where, what uh, Commissioner Lucas is referring to mm -hmm. is when uh, Judge Valley was reciting what was happening before him in a matter, not that he was accusing you of bombarding him with with new issues. I'm. Unless I'm, I'm mistaken. I, I must say, I, I, I share Commissioner Singh's understanding uh, that, that Judge Valley had said in the previous round, the newspaper article had just come out, and, and it was at that point that someone had raised that he was ambushed. He's had no complaint in this hearing. That, that, that was my understanding of, of, of what he, he said. Because as Commissioner Lucas says, everything that's been raised so far has been in the GCB's report. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, is that a fair? I think it's fair. I think I have said, and I have, I've tried to be as fair as possible to the person who complained. I've responded to it and I've said, I've accepted that there was this error. What happened last time, what the complainant does is afterwards, I said, but well, this is how you answered in the JSC, and it indicates that you should have granted us leave to appeal because you now show that you accepted you were, error, you were erroneous. And I'm saying no. The difference is that issue was not brought to my attention at the application for leave to st appeal stage. And that's why I did not s say anything to this body at that interview that contradicts what I'm saying now. Right. But that's what the difference is. As far as the ambush issues, I'm never saying that acting President Petsa is ambushing me. No. No, he's never done that. Nobody's done that. We, we, we this is something different. We just, yeah. I think our lines are crossed. All right. Thank you. Th 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 thank you, Judge, Judge Valley. And may I just ask that going forward, you try to keep your answers concise because when you say a whole lot of things, then you know the brain tends to switch off and you miss some of the things. I will do so. Thank you. Confusing. Thank you. Thank you. Let's just try thank to you for the advice. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Judge Pillay, your hand had been up at some stage. Do you still want to put questions to him? Um, I, I do. Thank you, right. DCJ. Um, Judge Valley, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I just, wanted to I just wanted to refer to the, um, the letter received from certain silks at Tunamela Chambers. Um, yes. I think it's by Maleka SC, Maroka SC, Bukaba SC, Mukwena SC, Nalani SC, and uh, Brian uh, Lichoche SC. I think you left out Gabashi SC. I'm not seeing her name on the, on the letter. Is it Maybe. not? Okay. I think she's probably left the Boston's. Oh, I see. I'm talking about the latest I'm letter. I'm sorry, um, yeah. No, you're abso absolutely correct. The latest letter also has Babashi AC as well. Yes. Um, where they raise their, their support for your, your candidature and they, they want this commission to take into account their view that any criticism about your, your temperament um, that that is not a view widely shared by members of the Joburg Society of Advocates. I don't know if you see that in their letter. I'm going to look for their letter. Can anybody? Um, it's not paginated. I'll find it. It's under a folder called Letter of Support. Oh, letters of Support. Yes, I found my version of it. Yes. I brought my 
on PPS. The one dated 26 August 2022. That's correct. So, and what that letter does is it endorses an earlier letter, again sent by the same set of silks, um, dated the 9th of September 2021. Yes. In which they they go at length into describing your work ethic, and you'll yes. see that in paragraph 14 of that letter. Now, yes, that's the, the earlier letter you refer yes, to. Yes, uh, so the later letter incorporates the earlier letter. Yes. Um, and perhaps you just want to take us through what it is that these silks are describing. They, they go at length and they identify specific incidents or, or kind of work patterns that you've adopted um, in order to, to meet your obligations yes. in the, in the Joburg High Court. Commissioner Pali, I find myself really inundated with a lot of work. And they were some of those people who had to appear before me in some of those matters. And I find that it is really difficult to just work within working hours and finish my work. And I tell that to counsel and I try and get it done. They witnessed it. They've also witnessed me in a number of other matters. And it was very kind of them to come and bring it to the attention of this committee to say, that their experience has been very different from the experience of other people, or the, the, the unnamed persons in the, in the GCB one. And they said they want to go on record saying that I've had this high work ethic. And I, I can't take it further than saying that I'm, I'm actually humbled by what they say, that I have considerable diligence, self-sacrifice, and devotion to my role. They say, he avails him, he hears matters late into the night. He avails hearings into hearings in the evenings. I mean, when I sit in, a, in an urgent court, I go through, if I have to go through till late, I do so, you know. But even in these special motions, they're very difficult to deal with because the paper is voluminous. And they've seen it. Um, and they've been, and they've also had discussions, I suppose, with each other, I don't know. But I'm, I'm humbled by what they say about it. And I, I, I would certainly think that it's a fair, ref, fair reflection of my work. Uh, judge Vanny, the second issue I wanted to ask you about is the fact that you sit now as the senior judge on the Competition Appeal Court. Yes. Now, when you were a member of the bar, did you do any competition work? None. And some of this is going to come out in the next interviews, so I don't want to say too much. But what had come out to me when I got there, and I got there after six years on the bench, that this was ducks, water over ducks back for me. It was just anybody can do this work. I have been asking other counsel to get involved in this work, and I'm going to raise this when we come back here another time. It's not work that's given to a lot of counsel, most counsel, in fact. And yet it's work most counsel can do. And there's a handful of counsel that only had that work, but from my sitting on learning the matters and deciding the matters and writing judgments that have been, that have, been, that have received the praise, I found that this is really an area that is un, unnecessarily, um, uh, unnecessarily uh, presented as, as something special and, and, un, uh, and outside of the reach of all counsel. That's not true. I think many counsel, yourself included, and I've, you've appeared before me, and I've had your heads of arguments in some matters, would easily walk into this area. I think many counsel. So I didn't appear in that court, but it, didn't, it did not handicap me from sitting in that court. And now I'm the, what's effectively the acting judge president of that court. Thank you. Thank you, DCJ. Commissioner Pule, the judgments I've written in that court have been upheld by the Constitutional Court. They were dissenting judgments, or at least I know one of them. Go ahead, Prof. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Chief Justice. Uh, good, good afternoon, Judge. Good afternoon. Uh, um, now, Commissioner, uh, I can't see your name. Oh, Marumo Akai. Marumo Akai. Yes. Thank you. Um, I know Marumo, uh, I've never heard Marumo Akai. Now you it's have. The first time. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, there is, picking up on what Commissioner Pillay was, was talking about, it's not the matter that I wanted to ask you about, but 
it, it, it really triggered my mind because I remember reading one of your judgments in competition law, just don't have it in front of me now. Um, Isipini, Isipani, Isipani. Isipani. Yes, you remember that, 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 that matter? Yes, Isipani. Yes. Where you so had to deal with... Is it not in my list of judgments? It, it might have been. It might have been. I read it some quite, quite, quite a long time yes. ago. I think that, that that judgment dealt with Section 401 of the Competition, oh, Act. The Competition Act. And in particular, collusive bidding and rigging and all those yes. things, cartels basically. Yes. And, and I say this because something that happened in my, in my, in my classroom, right, in my lecture hall. I think you, you, you said something in the first few paragraphs of that judgment. Uh, you referred to unlawful collusion, the word unlawful collusion. Yes. And, and the debate in the class was, but can we really say that a collusion is unlawful? Because oh, right. collusion generally is per se illegal. Uh, it, it's one I of those see, restrictive horizontal uh, practices that you yes, that are no, I, the I rule of reason won't apply to it. No, I see your point. Yes. I get your point. But that's not the method I wanted to ask you about. Yes. Um, the method I wanted to ask you about is in relation to um, the National Union of Metal Workers of SA uh, versus VR Laser we services. Laser, yes. You remember, and this case is important, and I think uh, the business rescue case. The business rescue one, and yes. and and. I quite enjoyed reading this judgment, and I think it is, it is one of those important uh, contributions uh, where the judgment per se deals with business rescue, but it intersects to some respect into the aspects of labor law, right? Yes. Where you have to deal with section 189 of the Labor yes. Relations Act. Yes. And I see that you, in the judgment, uh, you focused more on the security uh, that Yes. creditors have during business rescue and the role of the business rescue practitioner in relation to disposing of those assets um, during the process of business rescue. And, you dis and I, I agree with your reasoning. But the thing is, you, you, you also referred to section 189 and you did not go to the distance with it. But I just want to ask you a general question in relation to that. There is an issue currently in the labor court um, where the issue of forum shopping is actually are arising in relation to retrenchments that employees bring uh, during business rescue, uh, business rescue proceedings. Uh, because the argument is business rescue provides you with a mor moratorium, right? Yes. Then that means one cannot be able to be taken to court, litigated against, and all those things. You are given three months to breathe. So those things happen. Yes. I just want to understand, um, how do you see the South African law developing in terms of retrenchments that are brought during business rescue proceedings? Well, I mean, we already have a lot of, a lot of checks and balances in the law itself. They need to be part of it, consulted, and they are made, if I recall, preferent creditors. There's something about post-finance debt and pre-finance debt and something to that effect. Just for the, for the record, VR Laser was a very painful case for me. And the counsel that appeared before me was involved with me in my struggle days. And I said to him, the heart bleeds on this case. Because what had happened there is that those employees were asked to work for three months without pay. And now when it came to having to pay them their back pay, it was told this money is going to go to the bank. And then I looked at the law, and that's when it came out that unfortunately it had to go to the bank and not to them. And it was quite painful to some really, really heart-wrenching, heart-wrenching uh, affidavits put by some of those employees as to what was happening to them in their lives. Um, but yes, the 189 process does provide for that, and fortunately some of the unions do take advantage of that. It's a long time since I worked in labor law. Um, I was very good at it when I was at the bar, uh, and it's because I was a trade unionist. So I know labor law fairly well. I, was, I know it from the side of, a, of the trade union, so yeah. And I know what happens in the retrenchment processes. But I was one of those who argued at the time that the consultation process must be a meaningful process. It mustn't just be a formalistic process. I consulted you, I can dismiss you now. It's done. In fact, if I recall, and this is going back more than 20 years ago, Justice Malambo wrote one of the leading judgments at the time on what consultation should mean. 
And I was one of those who was a strong proponent of that view. So what we can do here is give them, maybe we can, in, and the court can probably ensure that their interests are receiving um, the due attention when the business rescue practitioner is already running the process rather than only just their creditors. No, no, thank you very much, uh, Judge Valley. I think on a, on, on a lighter note, um, I, I realize that your, your judgments in most of the cases are, are pretty long. Yes. I think you need to, to, to practice reducing them so we should, you will be successful to the Supreme Court of Appeal because this might work in the Constitutional Court, but I doubt in, in, in the Supreme Court of Appeal with the guidelines that are available there, this might the work. Supreme Perhaps a judgment like this it might take 17 pages or so. I, I will, I, I'll, I, I'm, I'm happy to learn. In this profession, we learn every day. I'm happy to learn how to. Uh, but I also hope, uh, Commissioner, that they also have academic value. You said to me it was in your class. So I also yes. hope they have academic, they also have scholarly value. Um, I wouldn't yeah. comment on the scholarly, but yes, definitely uh, value, certainly. Well, OK, thank you. Thank you. Any further questions, colleagues? Oh, sorry, Commissioner Stenger. Afternoon, Judge Valley. Afternoon. Um, I'm the, um, the member from the GCB uh, at today's hearing, and yeah. it's incumbent, well. incumbent upon me to, to raise some of the concerns that, that they have raised uh, yes. in the written report before you. Yes. Um, f firstly, to say um, I, I read the letter from my colleagues at Tulamela, um, and I think there's a lot of truth in it, and they certainly hold that view dearly. Um, but I don't think that erases the, those who hold a different view. Mm. Uh, and there are many in Tulamela who asked me to please raise that concern about temperament and rudeness. So I merely ask you to acknowledge that uh, the positive view doesn't erase the negative view, and perhaps it's something that you could take on board. I'm, I'm happy to take on board, and I'm happy to change my ways where I'm wrong, and I'm happy to admit where I'm wrong. I am wrong many, I can be wrong many times. But it also helps uh, Commissioner Steinberg if one gets details and one gets told this is you were wrong here, so then you can actually absorb, digest it, you know. And once you absorb it, then you can make changes. It's sometimes very difficult to do so. It comes across as if you don't take that criticism into account, but you don't if no one brings it to you. I would like them to raise it up front and say this is what way it was and this is what went wrong. Uh, I would, and I would certainly take note of it. I'm very happy to, to change my ways in the new time. Thank you, Judge Bay. Thank you. Um, the, one of the issues that hasn't been raised, um, on page 140, 140. Um, paragraph 14.2, I can actually read it to you, it's not long. Mm. Um, the GCB says, the candidates sometimes disregard for binding nature of precedent. Okay, I know that. And in yes. particular, his reliance on his own decisions is concerning. Even if the candidate has sound reason for disagreement with the higher court's decision and articulates this in the judgment, precedent is binding. Failure to follow precedent may be interpreted by the public as a disregard for the rule of law. And then they give, I think, three examples yes. where the, um, the appeal court has expressly criticized uh, your judgment yeah, let's look at these for examples. Um, disregarding clear precedent. Um, one of them is uh, the Capitec Coral yes. Lagoon judgment, yes. which I see in the transcript you were questioned about last time. Yes. And you responded by saying that the problem had something to do with a conflict between the approaches of the SCA and the Constitutional Court, but the question wasn't followed up, and I'm interested to do so now. What did you mean by that? I don't know what you're referring to as what was said last time, but let's just take this issue one step at a time. The first issue is, as I understand it, 
is <clears throat> disrespectful or non-compliance with precedent. I think that's the first and most important issue. I think that's not correct. And I think as a statement, it's very important to accept what they're saying is true. We must, the Stare Diseases Principle must be applied. Otherwise, rule of law becomes meaningless. There's no, there's no quarrel with that point. Did I not follow? That's the underlying theme. Did I not follow? And I see you nodding, meaning that's the question. That's what the focus is on. Did I not follow precedent? My answer is no, that's not correct. At the time Capitec was out, Pideka was not out. At the time I dealt with Capitec, I had written Atlantis, a very detailed and carefully thought out judgment, which judgment, by the way, has been supported by Fronoman J in Bideka. Of course, he's a minority, but it was. If you look at his judgment, he talks about the same issues. But what I did in those cases is followed Botha versus Rich, which is also constitutional court authority. So, sorry, you followed what? Botha versus Rich, which is constitutional court authority, which I drew from and looked at in the context of its previous constitutional court judgments. Barkhazen was one of them. Everfresh was another one of them. But and I said, these are, this is the precedence that is coming out of the Constitutional Court. And applying that precedent, this is the conclusions I come. But at that stage, there was this debate that there was this debate as to what exactly is, is the one that's coming out of the Constitutional Court, uh, uh, court what law, or is there a difference between what they're saying and what the SCA is saying? So I followed, as far as I can understand, the Constitutional Court. Since then, the Constitutional Court has clarified its position. But in those cases you mentioned, pre badika the Constitutional Court in no way said that uh, the, the expressed terms of a contract can be disregarded if it's unfair in the view of the no, judge. No, I don't know. I don't know if, if we're on the same wavelength. I've never said that expressed terms can be disregarded just for that reason. I've said express terms must be interpreted in a specific form. And I said, if you look at, and if you need to look at Atlantis very carefully, you need to look at it because you can't read Capitec without reading Atlantis. I, and, uh, Judge, I can assure you I've read, I've read and those so cases. And so in Atlantis, I spell out what the Constitutional Court says as to what the approach should be. I then look at what the Constitutional Court did in Barcazen, what it did in Everfresh. I also say that what the Constitutional Court said in those cases appear to be different from what the SCA said in Bredenkamp. And in Bredenkamp, they had their own, inter in, in what you call it, in uh, Bredenkamp, Froneman tells us quite clearly, Bredenkamp, as far as he's concerned, was, um, Bredenkamp, as far as he was concerned, is wrong. So I went grappling with those issues, but to say that I've just gone ahead, I don't know about unfairness, I spoke about good faith. And good faith is an important consideration. In fact, it's, it's one that's bedeviling the contract law all over the world. And yeah. one of the best, better judgments is that in the Canadian courts. There's also Lord um, Stain, who's, an ex, who's a previous South African, who's also written a number of extrajudicial articles on good faith. So I've looked at good faith and I've looked at our courts, judgments on good faith, and I went right down to the, right to the, to the beginning of it. So I don't think it's correct to say I ignored uh, uh, stare diseases, I ignored precedents. But you did expressly follow your own minority judgment. But it was following, but the judgment is followed, and I said in that minority judgment, that I'm following constitutional court judgments. I'm following what the constitutional court has said. And that's where the difference lies. And, and Look, did, it's did a debate you, we, I'd love to have with you. And I'd love to have them with the judgments in front of us, all of those judgments. Okay, I'll, I'll leave and, and, and then you'd be able to see uh, I was just told I, I should be careful about being over-elaborate in my answers. No, I, I, 
accept that. And, and, and I can, I'd love to have this debate. In fact, after writing Atlantis, I was quite happy to give a lecture. In fact, I was, I was invited by one group to come and lecture to their group members, and then they invited everyone else. And then I don't know what happened. I can't remember the entire details, and it didn't take place. So I was quite happy to, to, to face anybody and say, and discuss with academics, advocates, whoever, and say, let's look at it. This is an issue, of course, it's, it's going to be a difficult issue. It's going to be with us for a long time. Judge, Judge Valley, the fact remains that. Has the point not been made, though? Uh, I, I, I would just like to conclude this point. Okay, all right. With your permission. Yeah. Let's just try to that, round, round off. That the, the, the GCB points out three judgments of the SCA, which two of them expressly um, upbraid you for not following precedent. Um, mm. Those are the, the Capitec case, mm. case and the municipal workers case. And okay. in the De Beers case, they note that the judge, the judge w w was shocked by the sentence you imposed, suggesting oh. again oh, you that's hadn't a different, followed precedent. Oh, that's a different matter now. No, no, Sorry, let, De Beers let me ask, is a no, different no, issue. Let me ask my question, Judge. Yes. There are, there are three judgments that are pointed to here. Okay, give me the paragraph number. Um, paragraph 7.3.5.4. So we're on page 130. 7.3.5.4. Right. Sorry. 7.3.5. No, no, no. Um, seven point three. We're in the seven point threes. So seven point three point four point two. That's the one about the LRA. Yeah, Ms. that's South Steinberg. African Municipal Workers Union. Okay, Ms. Steinberg, we heard earlier about shop, forum shopping. This is a matter in which the union came to the High Court. And the question was whether the High Court has jurisdiction or the Labor Court has jurisdiction. I applied what I believed, or what was my understanding, of a constitutional court judgment called Kava. Kava is a judgment that talks about when you can go to the labor court and when you can go to the high court. The SCA said, no, they should never have come to the high court. They should have gone to the labor court. I respect they were different. We came to a different conclusion. But the, there was a constitutional court decision, and still, anybody who knows labor law will know Kaaba was a leading case in the early, early days when we had this huge uncertainty as to when can you go to the labor court and when can you go to the high court. And there's a number of judgments before that as to, well, I think they have concurrent jurisdiction, they have this. So this particular case, is there was a special plea, and it was a very long time ago, it was 2016. There was a special plea which said, you're in the wrong court. And I said, no, but they're not in the wrong court because they're not raising labor issues. They're not relying on labor law rights. And Kaba says, they can come to this court when they're not. And that's the conclusion I came to. I've subsequently been overturned by someone. But you must, if you want to understand these issues, uh, Commissioner Steinberg, you need to know a lot more about what, to, what, what the law stands for. No, I, I take issue with that. Uh, you, you're suggesting I don't know what No, no, it means. I'm saying no, 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 I'm not suggesting. Please, I, I apologize I, if, that's the, if, my, if that's the suggestion my, I made. No, no. My, 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 final, my final question 
Are you saying then that in both cases where the SCA expressly upbraided you for not following clear precedent, they are wrong? No, what I'm saying is they may be right by saying I, sh I, sh I, I misread Kaaba, but I applied Kaaba. No. Are thank we you. understanding each other, Ms. Steinberg? We are. Thank Please, you, if Judge. there's any issues you've got, I'm happy to clarify them. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Commissioner Lucas? In the interest of time, let me forego my opportunity. In the interest of time, yes, please. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Moimang? Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Deputy Chief Justice. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Judge Bali. Good afternoon. I can't see your name because you're not appearing on the screen. Moimang. Moimang. Moimang, yeah. Thank you, Commissioner Moimang. Uh, just uh, two areas that I want to converse uh, with uh, uh, Judge Valley. <clears throat> the, the, the first one is the is the question that you that you uh, uh, responded to in terms of what is to be done with contracts that are made by corruption. Yes. In the in the Transnet uh, uh, versus IGS IGS Consulting. Uh, <clears throat> uh, if we could just uh, explain the importance of ensuring that the beneficiary of uh, corruption do not uh, uh, benefit from the fruits of corruption. If you can just elaborate on that. Uh, but it's also linked to the, the, uh, the point that was conversed earlier on on Econ uh, versus, uh, versus uh, ESCOM, mm. because both, both are matters of state-owned uh, entities that uh, uh, were recently in, in the news, not only as a result of uh, corruption, but also the issue of load shedding. And I think the, the thrust of the, of the judgment respond uh, posit positively to the calls uh, to stem out corruption. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> now, the second point uh, uh, is, is, is taking further the point that was raised by, by the minister in the matter between uh, DA and the Minister of uh, International Relations. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, and I appreciate the, 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 the appre uh, acknowledgement from your side that in certain instances this matter are polycentric. Mm. However, given the judgment, uh, which is more or less similar to, to what happened with the Al-Bashir matter, because in that instance, the executive took a, to, to, took a political decision. Mm. Uh, because uh, uh, of uh, uh, our, our, our approach to international relations, which is correctly mm. captured in the in chapter seven of the uh, National Development Plan, mm. our entry to the global politics is through Africa, mm. and and more so the the relationship that uh, that our country has with the uh, mm. former frontline states and the and the SADC region in particular. Mm. Don't you think that sometimes, in matters of this nature, the courts should exercise? Uh, judicial restraint and uh, uh, linked to that, don't you think that uh, <clears throat> uh, sometimes judgment of this nature are the one that leads to the criticism of our courts and also uh, Clarion calls for judicial difference in certain uh, matters of this nature uh, and also calls for for a, a change in terms of our democracy, moving away from constitutional democracy to, to parliamentary supremacy under which judicial action is extremely limited and not much is expected on the proactive role mm -hmm. of the judicial action. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Acting President. Uh, thank you, uh, Judge Bali. Thank you. 
I think President. Uh, Thank you, Commissioner Moima. I think President, I'm going to try and give a short answer. I just want to say I respect that there are polycentric issues. I also respect, and more importantly, this is one not focused on. I respect that the executive make decisions in ways and on basis very different from the way courts do. What we regard as law of evidence, they don't necessarily regard it. If they find something is a fact, they don't have to have it proven, and they make a decision on that. That said, so therefore I accept, we, and a third point I accept, is that courts must never assume that they have greater wisdom than other branches of government. But at the same time, I say that those branches of government must operate within the rule of, within the constitution and the law. I say courts too must do that. And I've done, and I say that's how we'll only solve this problem. I'm not sure as far as issues of parliamentary supremacy and that is concerned, I don't want to get into that in this forum. I know it was not accepted by our government in 1993-94 when we had this change over. We specifically went for constitutional democracy. What happens from now on, I don't know, it's not in my purview. That I leave for people better qualified than myself. Thank you. Judge Valley, we are almost at the tail end of your interview. And before I excuse you, is there anything that you want to say to the commission? And if so, I will allow you only three minutes. Thank you. Uh, sorry, IP? Sorry, IP, have you um, oh, remembered oh, the Oh, I'm sorry. Line? I'm sorry, just bear with me for a, a moment, uh, Judge Valley. Commissioners who are on the virtual platform, uh, Commissioner Barnard. Thank you, Ivy. Um, Judge Valley, um, I'd like just want to take further the, the question about the, or the, the criticism of the GCB regarding certain of the judgments. And uh, the question I have is with, with regards to the judgments that have been overturned on appeal. What lessons have you learned? And I, and I ask it specifically against the backdrop. I've categorized the, the um, criticisms of the higher courts of your work into three categories. The one is regarding evidence. So in the Maropa versus Chemical Industries, um, which is referred to in 7.3.1.5, they criticized you for not interrogating evidence uh, properly. And then in 7.3.4, for in the lack of property versus right, the criticism launched by the court is your manner of conducting the trial by allowing a witness to read the evidence extensively from the affidavit. So those two I've categorized under evidence. Um, the binding precedent my colleague uh, has already questioned you on. So um, that's the Capitec and the SA Municipal Workers Union, which were both dealt with it. In the SA Municipal Workers Union versus Mokhatla, uh, it was said that you failed to follow two, pr uh, two principles laid down by two constitutional court matters, or the principles like that. And then, of course, there's the errors in, in discretion with sentencing, which, which induced a sense of shock on appeal. So those are various things. So with all of that backdrop in mind, what are the lessons that you've learned from, from matters where matters have been taken on appeal? No, I think... It's very important to learn from other people as to where you went wrong. It's a hard job to sit alone first time around and make the decisions. And I accept that I've been overturned in some in these judgments. And I think the lesson to be learned is try and be more careful and take note of what they've said as to where you went wrong. So the next time you get the same case, I'll now know where to go. I'll look at what they've said to the guard. So yes, I will take on board whatever criticisms they've made. If you want me to respond to each one of them, that's a different matter. I don't think, I'm not sure I understand you to want me to do that. Uh, no, it's just a question generally. It's generally, very, yes. Yeah. No, then, I've answer, then, then I believe I'll, what, it gets, what it has taught me is just 
Take note of what they've said if ever you get the same or similar case again. I will take that into account. Um, Sorry, I interrupt you. Sorry? Uh, no, okay, I thought no, I interrupted no, so, you. Sorry. Oh, is it? Uh, sorry, are you on? No, I was saying, as far as I will definitely take it, do take note of what they've said in those cases. Um, but, I mean, as you say, you don't want me to respond to each specific one. So I, I'll, my answer is a simple one, which is they've pointed out to me very significant errors on my part, and I must take note of them, and I will take note of them. And then do so when I continue in my next case, other cases, I've done that. I will do that. I do not Maybe believe I have all the answers to all the problems. Um, Thank you. My last question is just, uh, what would you say to, if someone were to argue and say that, um, you know, when there are matters being investigated by the JCC, it might be oh, wise for, no, for the JCC. First, you first, you know, hold a, a the wait, wait the outcome of that before I making a recommendation. I, 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 would, I would caution against following that approach in this case, because I believe that, unfortunately, that was brought to me so late, but I've explained why I think there's no merit in it, and I believe that the Supreme Court of Appeal has already pronounced on it. The Supreme Court of Appeal has found the judgment to be unimpeachable. And if that is so, then the judgment's correct. What's the, the complaint can have no merit in that circumstances. The complaint, and I've tried to explain here and now for the public and everybody to know what the complaint's about. And I've admitted where the error was, but it doesn't affect, the, it, it does not affect, or the, you know, it does not affect my, my answer, which is that there's no merit in it. And there's no reason to wait for that. There's no reason to wait for it. It's unfortunate it came to me so late. Uh, it came to me just, just a month ago. And then there's a danger if you follow that, uh, Commissioner, that somebody can just do that in the last minute. Something that happened last year. And if they can do that, then they can frustrate you. So you also have to take that into account, Commissioner. I can't see your name, Commissioner, so please, uh, please accept my apology if I don't call you by your name. Uh, Thank you very much. It's Commissioner Barnard, and you have answered. Thank you very much. Thank that's, you, Commissioner that's my Barnard. Question. Thank you, Commissioner Barnard. Yeah. Just a small point of correction, Judge uh, Valley. As I understand it, what went to the SA was actually just an application for leave to appeal, which Correct. was dismissed. Correct. But and you it, said uh, the SCA has found your judgment unimpeachable. Which means that no other court will come no, to no, a different I, I'm conclusion. I'm just reacting to the unimpeachable. The SCA has not delivered any judgment okay, no. on the issue. I'll accept that. Yeah, it well, means just meant, agreed with the result yes. you, you gave in your judgment. Yes. That just that tiny correction. I'll accept that. Uh, yeah. A follow-up on DCJ, follow-up. Yes. Uh, judge, I just want to, you know, um, in most instances, in, in, in a country where you have different courts, lower courts and, and, and superior courts, there seems to be this idea that when a lower court is overturned by a superior court, as a matter of fact, the superior court is correct. Um, and I think we will be doing ourselves a serious disservice if we adopt that kind of analogy. Mm. Um, yes, of course, lower courts can be wrong, mm. but so too the superior courts. Mm. Now the question is, when you get a judgment of a superior court that overturns you, do you engage with it just to see perhaps maybe your reasoning maybe was flawed? How do you kind of like deal with it? It's, it's a complicated issue and it's a complicated question. First thing I must point out to you, sometimes the case they take to the superior court is not identical to the one they bring to you. They can change emphasis, they can change, it becomes more nuanced. So then you, you don't know whether you've learned any lesson when you read there because it was not put before you. So that's that. But when it was put before you and you came to a different conclusion, then you must accept if you were wrong, you must accept it. And I'm accepting that. 
I don't think one must ever take the view that they're always wrong and we're always right. That's wrong. And, that, and anybody who holds that view, I think, needs to reconsider. So yes, and then the other view, sometimes the superior courts, sometimes you find the first judge has been upheld when it goes further. As good examples are a first judge get overturned by the SCA, then gets upheld by the CC, Competition Court. That's happened so many times. So, but if you catch the person at the moment where we only have the SCA judgment, you say, but you, was, you, know, you made these errors. And then comes, of course, the Constitutional Court, and you say, but we don't think there were those errors. So it's very hard. It's a very difficult situation. And of course, it will have to be dealt with on a case-specific basis. And you have to look at the criticisms carefully. You need to look at it. So yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I agree fully with you, uh, Commissioner. Thank you it's very Commissioner much. Commissioner Marumo Akai. Marumo Akai. Commissioner Breitenbach, do you have a question for Judge Vali? No, thank you, Deputy Chief Justice. I'm covered. Oh, thank you. Uh, Judge Vali, I understand that my colleague on my right had given you an opportunity to address us. Thank you just, very just much. Just briefly, if you have anything thank you, you want no, to say. Thank you. No, I don't have anything I wish to say. I just to say thank you for the opportunity to keep present my candidature to you. Thank, 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 thank you to you Thank too. you. Well. Thank All you. right. You, you're excused. Thank you all.